Uh, welcome, everybody. This is I'm Ben Francisco Malbeck from Hispanics and Philanthropy. Welcome to our HIP Philanthropy Lab. This is our ongoing series of webinars uh, to provide a, a virtual forum for our members and funders and other uh, leaders concerned about nonprofits, uh, concerned about Latino communities, to uh, come together and discuss important issues that uh, that are affecting Latinos, and talk about what we as as funders and other leaders can do. Uh, to have more of an impact uh, in Latino communities. Uh, today's topic is Alabama's HB 56 uh, law and the national wave of anti-immigrant legislation. Um, we're covering this topic today because uh, immigration is a top concern for Hispanics and philanthropy as a network of, of funders working in Latino communities. And as we've seen in Arizona and now Alabama and several other states, there's been a wave of, uh, of quite severe anti-immigrant legislation in several states um, and that we fear may actually also uh, affect other states in 2012. So we thought it was a, a timely and important topic and have brought together several panelists who will be each sharing a, a variety of perspectives on this issue to give us all a more in-depth understanding of the issue. Um, just so you all know for background, all of you are on mute except for our panelists to prevent too much background noise. We will have a question and answer period at the end. You'll notice uh, in the lower right portion of your screen, you should see a, a chat area. And if you have questions that come up, particularly any questions around uh, clarity of something not understood, uh, or if you're having trouble with audio or anything, please feel free to chat me, uh, Ben Francisco Malbeck, or uh, Adam Gesheves, uh, who is our technical, who's handling the technical side, and we will gladly help you uh, fix whatever problem you're having or uh, get your question answered. Um, and you can also ask substantive questions about the content of the lab itself, and you can send that to me or to any of our panelists, and we'll do our best to answer them either during the course of the webinar or when it comes later to the question and answer period. Um, I, I'd also like to recognize and thank our two co-sponsoring partners today. APIP, uh, which is Asian American Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy, and AFI, the Association of Black Foundation Executives. Um, and we're especially pleased to have them partnering with us on this lab today because th this is an issue that certainly affects all of our communities and that too often uh, divides our communities. So we're very happy that, um, that our three affinity groups are working together uh, as we try to heighten uh, awareness and have more in-depth discussion around immigration issues. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We'll be starting with Mary Bauer, who's the legal director of uh, immigration of uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. And Mary, I'm wondering if you could just start by giving us an overview of what, uh, you know, what is in this law, what is uh, the effect that you've seen to date, what is, and what's the status of the case? And I should mention uh, you and Southern Poverty Law Center are among the lead litigators on this case. So I'm sure you have a more in-depth view than, than almost anybody out there. Uh, so thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about uh, HB 56 and the devastating effects that it's had on our state. Um, with the ACLU and the National Immigration Law Center, the Southern Poverty Law Center is uh, one of the lead organizations working on the litigation to challenge uh, HB 56 in federal court. Um, I want to talk just briefly about kind of where HB 56 came from and the origin. It was drafted, at least in part, by a man named Chris Kobach, who is with the Immigration Reform Law Institute, um, known as EARLY. EARLY is a legal arm of the Federation for American Immigration Reform, FAIR, uh, which is a group that has been listed as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, and, and the point of this is to say that although the effects are being perpetrated upon the state of Alabama, this is clearly part of a larger anti-immigrant agenda. And, and what I have said kind of repeatedly, this is, uh, I, I worry, coming soon to a state near you and, and certainly something you want to avoid. Um, in Alabama, the law was sponsored by Senator Scott Beeson, who urged his fellow legislators to quote, empty the clip, end quote, and do what needs to be done in discussing the need to combat illegal immigration. His House 
the House representative co-sponsor said that in drafting the bill, they intended it to attack every aspect of an illegal immigrant's life. The law as passed had 30 provisions. About seven of those provisions have been enjoined by the District Court in Birmingham or by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and we had a, a kind of small victory on one issue uh, late last week that I'll, I'll just talk about um, briefly, that sort of in our larger case, Hika v. Bentley, the provisions there that have been enjoined or blocked by the court include um, <clears throat> Section 13, which made it a crime to transport or provide shelter to undocumented immigrants, thereby criminalizing many charitable and religious operations. Section 8, that prohibited many legal immigrants from attending public college or university in the state. And kind of most uh, famously, Section 28, which required school officials to inquire as to the legal status of public school children and their parents. Section 28 went into effect for approximately two weeks before it was enjoined by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And although we are uh, very pleased that that law is not in effect. Great damage has already been done. Um, Latino children have heard the message loud and clear that they are not wanted in this state. In fact, um, HB 56 has devastated the immigrant community in Alabama. It would be hard for me to overstate the kind of human tragedy that has been unleashed upon Alabama by this law. And I, I just talk about a couple of the provisions that are currently in effect um, and kind of how they're playing out in the real world. Uh, I think there are really at least three provisions that are particularly devastating. That inc They include um, Section 12, which is the sort of uh, Arizona-style show me your papers provision. Um, this is Alabama's the first state in which this provision has actually gone into effect and not been blocked by the court. So we, we have seen a real significant uptick in the arrest and detention of people. Um, we also are very concerned about Section 27, which makes it illegal to contract with someone who's undocumented and makes the contracts of undocumented people unenforceable. Uh, and this has played out in a lot of devastating ways, including um, kind of in the rental of housing and in the workplace where people are, uh, you know, being cheated out of wages and being told that their contracts are not enforceable. Uh, but probably the most devastating part of the law is Section 30, which has made, uh, which makes it a crime for undocumented people to attempt to enter into business transactions with the state. And this has been interpreted in the most uh, extreme uh, in, and sort of unexpected ways, far beyond what the, the impact that even we anticipated it would have. And what it has done really is to make undocumented people unable to interact with the government in any way and for any purpose. Um, it has really turned a significant class of people effectively into legal non-persons. Um, and and I, I want to talk just a little bit about what that means in the real world. I, I know some of our other speakers will also address this, but uh, after HB 56 went into effect, SPLC and the other groups representing plaintiffs uh, started a telephone hotline to field calls about the law. In the first weekend, we received close to 1,000 phone calls. We've now received about 4,000 phone calls, and we've received many other complaints through other means as well. Uh, the breadth of the problems that are created both directly and indirectly by the law is, is breathtaking. And I'll, I'll just share with you uh, a handful of the kinds of uh, stories that we've been hearing from people. Um, a mother in northern Alabama was told that she could not attend a book fair at her daughter's school without an Alabama state ID. A father called to report that his U.S. citizen daughter had come home weeping from school after other students told her she did not belong there and that she needed to go back to Mexico, a country she had never visited. A judge advised a lawyer that the lawyer had the obligation to report her own client to ICE as undocumented. That same judge stated that he might have to report to ICE any person who asked for an interpreter because such a request would be a red flag. Wow. Latino workers on a construction job site were threatened by a group of men with guns who told them to go back to Mexico and threatened to kill them if they were there the following day. 
they declined to report the crime to law enforcement because of fears of what would happen to them if they did make that report. A victim of domestic violence went to court to obtain a protective order. The clerk told her that she would be reported to ICE if she proceeded. A local bar association advised its lawyers that if they are asked to report information about their undocumented clients to law enforcement, the requirements of HB 56 will override the legal obligation to preserve a client's confidences. By the first Monday after HB 56 was allowed to take effect, 2,285 Latino students were absent from schools across the state. This represents about 7% of the total Latino school population. Since then, the Attorney General and the state have refused to share enrollment and absentee data with anyone, including the United States Department of Justice. A public school in Montgomery asked already enrolled Latino students questions about their immigration status and that of their parents. In Allgood, the Water Authority posted a sign indicating that water customers would have to provide identification documents in order to maintain water service. In Northport, the Water Authority provided notices to Latino customers that their services would be shut off if they didn't provide proof of immigration status. In Madison County and in Decatur, the public utilities have announced they will not provide water, gas, or sewage service to people who cannot prove their status. Numerous probate offices, including Montgomery and Houston County, have published notices indicating they will not provide services to anyone without proof of immigration status. As a result, many immigrants cannot request birth or death certificates, even for their U.S. citizen family members. An apartment complex manager in Hoover told residents they would not be able to renew their leases without proof of immigration status. Legal immigrants, including those with temporary protected status, have been told they cannot obtain driver's licenses. A worker called to say that his employer refused to pay him, citing HB 56, and stated that the worker had no rights to be paid under this law. A mother spoke to the local office of the Department of Human Resources about her U.S. citizen children's eligibility for food stamps. The social worker told the mother that she would turn the mother into the federal government for deportation. The family went into hiding. A husband called us to report that his wife, nine months pregnant, was too afraid to go to a hospital in Alabama to give birth and that he was trying to decide whether to have her give birth at home or somehow to try to get to Florida. A Latino man was arrested and detained. While in j jail, he was told that he could not use the telephone to call his attorney because the use of the phone would be a business transaction prohibited by HB 56. That is uh, a small hand, handful of the of the calls that we've received. We've got 3,980 something more more uh, stories and and uh, and thousands more that we've not yet heard. Uh, in in conclusion, I would just say that that this law has uh, undoubtedly created a humanitarian disaster in in our state. We've been heartened by the support we've received from people in other states, by the uh, members of Congress who came to visit, by the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, right now we are, uh, our sort of legal ask or our, our political ask out there in the world is to call upon the Department of Homeland Security to suspend um, removal and detention of people uh, who are picked up pursuant to this law. Um, and uh, and we are uh, calling upon the federal government to um, to give real meaning to their statement that they don't want to acquiesce in supporting this law. Thank you all again for uh, for listening today. Thank you, Mary, for that that uh, great overview of of the legislation as well as a, a good sense of the the terrible impact that it's having already on the ground. And we'll be hearing more from Mary and all of our panelists later as we enter into discussion and question and answer. Um, to continue uh, talking about what the impact of the legislation has been, uh, particularly in Latino communities, uh, we're now going to turn it over to Isabel Rubio, who is the executive director of ICA, the Hispanic Interest Coalition of Alabama, uh, which is the largest uh, and only staffed Latino nonprofit organization in the state of Alabama. Um, and who has seen firsthand what some of the uh, the effects that Mary already started talking about. Thanks for being here, Isabel. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to the fellow panelists and to everyone who's called in this afternoon. As you said, I'm Isabel Rubio, the founder and executive director of the Hispanic Interest Coalition of Alabama. CICA empowers the Hispanic, Alabama's Hispanic community and its numerous cultures as an economic and civic integrator, 
social resource connector and statewide educator who facilitate integration, citizenship, and civic contribution to our programs by connecting our constituents to critical social, legal, and economic resources and opportunities across the state. Tika has four programs, Strong Families, Community Engagement and Education, Immigration and Access to Justice, and Asset Building and Economic Development. Tika is the only independent community-based organization serving Alabama's Hispanic community and has been doing this work for over 10 years. We are located in Birmingham but work statewide. As Mary mentioned, HECA is the lead named plaintiff in the Civil Rights Coalition lawsuit filed by organizations, Southern Poverty Law Center, ACLU, the National Immigration Law Center, among others. HECA is also a founding and steering committee member of the Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice. HB 56 is the harshest immigration law in the country and has ignited a humanitarian, economic, and civil rights crisis in Alabama. It has the explicit... Sorry? Yes, I'm sorry to cut you off. Your speaker quality is a little bit low. Are you on a, a speakerphone or anything like that? Yes. Can you... Would it be possible for you to switch to your handset? It, it may improve the quality. Sure. Sure. Sorry oh, about that's that. much better. Yes, that's great. As, Thank you. As the harshest immigration law in the country, HB 56 has ignited a humanitarian, economic, and civil rights crisis in Alabama. It's the explicitly stated purpose of making Alabama so inhospitable that immigrants will deport themselves. Since this law emerged in the legislature in the spring of 2011, thousands of confused and scared Hispanics have come to HECA to get information about the law, about their rights, information about how to protect their families by making emergency plans and completing powers of attorneys. Since June, HECA has drafted over 500 powers of attorneys, um, and since in the weeks since Judge Blackburn's rulings, the offices have been inundated with more than 750 families seeking advice. So to put this into perspective, for all of 2010, HECA saw about 1,500 families. But through September of 2011, we have seen over 7,500 families through our doors. As Mary mentioned, Section 12, the Reasonable Suspicion Clause, is one of the ones which has created the most fear in the community. Our families are afraid to leave their homes for fear of being randomly pulled over by the failure of the courts to block this clause. Basically, people are fearful of being arrested and deported for driving while Latino. We talk to clients every day in our office, parents who are deeply stressed about their uncertain futures, how they are too afraid to drive to our English classes, attend meetings at their children's school, go to the grocery store, or even to church. Um, last week at the congressional hearing, we heard one story from a U.S. citizen. Isabel, are you there? I think Isabel might be having a slight technical difficulty. Uh, let us know if you're back, Isabel. Okay, I think Isabel may have temporarily lost her connection. So we will uh, bring her back in to finish her remarks in a moment, hopefully. Um, in the meantime, what I will do is uh, a little bit abruptly, we'll skip ahead to our next panelist, I think, and then hopefully circle back with uh, with Isabel when when she's able to rejoin us. Um, our next panelist is James Carlton, who is a uh, program officer at the Marguerite Casey Foundation, uh, which is uh, a foundation that focuses on social justice and the empowerment of low-income families, um, and uh, including immigrant families. Uh, and James, in particular, has a focus on the foundation's uh, portfolio in the southeast. So, James, I wonder if you could start just by, first of all, given that uh, Margaret Casey doesn't have a specific immigration focus, uh, how do you see uh, immigration advocacy and uh, work as connecting to your the foundation's core mission? And what has your what is your funding strategy uh, in this area been? Thanks, Ben. Um, and thanks for inviting me on. Um, Marguerite Casey is celebrating its 10th uh, year this year. Um, and as you said, it's a social 
our funding is specifically focused on social justice. So, of course, immigration law is a part of that. As a matter of fact, a lot of these things are connected. You mentioned that we that my portfolio is the southeast. It's actually the south. Um, we fund in eight states in the south. Um, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. And um, we see the opportunity there uh, to invest in a network of, for social justice. For example, uh, since 2002, Marguerite Casey has been funding in the southern region. Um, and over that period of time, we've made 98 grants, totaling about $46,800,000. Um, as of November of this year, we have 54 active grants, totaling about $11,940,000 in the South. And in Alabama, we currently have about six active grants, totaling about $1.1 million. Um, one of the reasons that, uh, that we are focusing and supporting a number of immigration organizations in the South, I think there are about six or seven that we support in those eight, eight states, is because, one, if you've noticed the, uh, the results of, of last year's census, uh, there's a growing new majority in the South, a majority of people of color, um, for the first time since I guess since they were counting people of color as full human beings, uh, the census showed that there's a new majority in, in the public school system, that the majority of kids that are in public schools in the South are either black or brown. Um, and for us, that um, opens up some opportunities. One, because the South has a long history of fighting racism, um, two, there could be some huge impacts on national policies since it seems pretty clear to us that um, for whatever reason, the right wing and conservatives in this country seem to be targeting the South to roll out a number of the, of the regressive policies that, that Mary and Isabel spoke to a little bit earlier. Um, it's sort of like a combination playground and laboratory for groups like uh, the Heritage Foundation, ALEC, um, so on and so forth, and some of the people that Mary named. Um, I guess they figure that if they can pass this legislation in the South, then they can export it to other states and other regions. And so we see an opportunity there to sort of build an infrastructure, not just in Alabama. I'd like to point that out, Ben that we're talking about Alabama today, but we could have easily be, been talking about Georgia or the Absolutely. number of pieces of legislation that were introduced in Florida or the 34 pieces of individual pieces of legislation that was introduced in Mississippi just in this legislative session this year. So we see it as an opportunity to invest in organizations like HECA um, and other members of the Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice and to organizations similar to that across the region who fight for social justice and who are made up and, and service communities, poor and working communities in the South and are managed by people from those communities. That's where we see our investment, in building that social justice infrastructure in the South. Great. Thank you, James. And we'll be – I'm sorry, were you, are you done, James? Yeah, well, I didn't want to cut you off. Okay, great. Um, and we will come back and hear more from you about uh, different funding strategies uh, once we're done with all the panelists. I want to come back to Isabel now, who we have – the mysterious technical difficulties, I believe, have been restored. Are you, are you back with us, Isabel? I'm back. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great. 
Um, so if you want to just pick up where you left off, you were talking about the, the reasonable suspicion clause being the one that was, you know, cause, particularly uh, causing a lot of hardship in our communities. Right. So as Mary said, this is the clause that was not blocked, um, that has been blocked in, in every other state um, other than Alabama. Um, but basically it, it's creating intense fear of people who are of being arrested and deported simply for driving while Latino. Um, we talk to clients every day in our office, um, parents who are just incredibly stressed about their uncertain future, how they're too afraid to drop to English classes, to church, to meetings at their kids' school, or even a grocery store. Um, an immediate concern, of course, is what would happen to their U.S. citizens' children in the hours and days after a possible detention, and more long-term worries about how their futures would change if, with their U.S. kids, they were deported. Many who are going back to a country where they fear crime and violence and know their children won't get the quality education that they are entitled to here in the U.S. Your children, likewise, don't want to go and leave the only home that they know. We can add to this families who are experiencing wage theft, blatant discrimination, um, and those who really feel like they have no other choice but to leave and so consequently are leaving everything, fully furnished homes and, you know, leaving to go to other places in the middle of the night. So in terms of what HECA has been doing, HECA has one organizer. Unfortunately, there's there is a um, not a lot of organizing capacity in the Latino community, and, and HECA has the only one organizer. But we are working um, with allies across the state to educate Hispanics on know your rights. Um, neighborhood defense committees are being formed, um, and so forth. We are really fortunate to have had an incredible outpouring of support from organizers across the country. But it's really at this moment that our community has got to build its own capacity to educate our constituents so that they know their rights and can defend themselves as well as continue to integrate into the host community. We can have a longer term strategy to increase our organizing capacity, which in the short term will work to repeal HB 56. But the mid and longer term strategies include continuing to organize, youth development, and ultimately civic engagement. It's through this increased capacity as part of the longer-term strategy that we know we can reach the more than 4,000 immigrants each year who become eligible to become U.S. citizens. And when we begin to start getting those folks um, to become citizens, register those folks to vote, get out the vote, we can really change the face of the policymakers in Alabama. As a state, we will never be able to push back against unjust and inhumane policies if we don't educate and engage the base community. Our organizer also gives Immigration 101 workshops in the host community and with allies across the state. Through this mechanism, we're educating the broader community on the realities of immigration and engaging allies in our work. But our only one organizer can do so much. Um, and while we are so grateful to the folks who have come from far and wide to help us, we recognize that the only way to sustain this work is to increase the capacity on the ground here in Alabama. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for the disruption earlier, and I look forward to your questions. No worries, and thank you, Isabel, for that great uh, view of what's happening and what ICA, uh, what ICA is doing to respond. Um, I now want to turn to our last panelist, Fernando Chang Moy, uh, who's actually a former uh, hip staffer and still a hipster, um, and who's currently a professor of law, immigration law at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and previously served as a program manager for the Emma Lazarus Fund of Southeastern Pennsylvania, an immigration focused fund. Uh, during the last wave of, of anti-immigration legislation in the in the 90s. Um, Fernando, both uh, Mary and James mentioned, you know, that this is really part of a larger trend happening across the country. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could speak to that a bit. What are sort of the macro trends that you're seeing uh, with this type of legislation across the U.S.? Sure. Thanks, Ben, and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Ben, for inviting me to be with you. Um, so we've heard from Mary and Isabel uh, as to the micro, what's going on in one little state or one big state, Alabama. So um, we thought that it might be useful just to set the big stage and <clears throat> share with you some of the trends going on at the federal stage. 
So what I'm going to do is for the next three minutes just um, squish a 14-week course in immigration law into uh, two and a half minutes now. But basically, and you're going to hear that what's going on in Alabama or the laws that the state of Alabama is trying to implement are already happening at the immigration at the federal level. So it's a little um, puzzling as to why Alabama wants to do it all when many of the provisions they're trying to implement are already happening. But anyway, um, at the federal level, we've, we have a long, we have an old 1952 law, which is the Immigration and Nationality Act, enacted in 1952, and it gets amended every year. And um, for purposes of the next few minutes, it has uh, several key parts. One part is how people can come in for a very short term. Um, another part deals with how people can come in for a long term. And a third part of our federal immigration law deals with how people can be deported and excluded. Um, so if people want to come in legally and with documents, so to speak, there are ways they can do that for a short term. They can come to work, uh, for example, at a mushroom factory or a chicken processing factory. And there are, there are laws and processes for doing this. Um, if folks want to come in and stay here for a long term, for example, if a hospital wants to sponsor um, a nurse, or if a, far, a mushroom farmer wants to uh, sponsor a mushroom picker for a long term, the, the federal law also allows us to do that. And thirdly, if anyone's breaking the immigration law, we deport them. And there are a number of reasons to deport people. Obviously, we can deport people if they don't have the right paperwork or um, if they have been convicted of a felony and, and so forth. So what I'm trying to say again is that the federal immigration law is, already has many of the provisions that we are seeing state laws trying to replicate and mirror. Again, it's puzzling. Though actually the states are going to say, well, the, immigration, the federal immigration system is broken. The feds aren't doing anything about it. Let us do something about it. Let's pass our own state laws. And then I'll, take us, and then I'll just end by saying um, that I'll take us all back to our fifth grade civics class where we studied the U.S. Constitution. And we'll remember the Constitution has a number of articles. And Article 6 says that the, law, the, law, the, law, the federal law is the supreme law of the land. And so we can't have a million immigration laws, a million tax laws. Texas can't make money. Only the United States can make money. Virginia can't declare war. Only the United States can declare war. And so in the areas of immigration law, the law, the, what Congress says is supreme. And we can't have little baby immigration laws all over the place. So this is what is happening. In the next, um, in the, uh, the next slide that you see, thank you for sharing it with us, um, Ben, we see that there are a number of laws that taste and sound and smell like immigration laws that are being passed by, um, you know, either municipalities or by states, which is in which lawyers would argue is in violation of the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution. So we have laws happening, being enacted in small towns like Hazleton, Hazleton Pennsylvania, or states like Alabama, et cetera, which are trying to do what the immigration federal law already does, though the states are saying they're not doing a good job, so we're going to pass our own damn state immigration laws. Uh, and there you have it. So the, the, the immigration policies that you see are pending, defeated, or enacted, and lawyers all across the country, like the Poverty, Southern Poverty Law Center or the ACLU, are filing lawsuits claiming that these state laws are unconstitutional for a number of reasons, either in violation of the Supremacy Clause or the Equal Protection Clause or, you know, some other parts of the Constitution. Um, and, and that's what's happening. The, the, the states, again, would claim we've got to do something about it because the feds are not. But, um, and the feds are saying, well, we are doing something about it and we're trying to come up with a comprehensive immigration bill. Let me go back to James and what his foundation is doing. So I guess maybe some of the things to think about, since the majority of the participants in this conference call our funders, is to think about, given what we've heard this afternoon, and I'll let um, James flesh that out a little bit more, what can we as funders do? So one is to continue to support direct service immigration nonprofits who are helping people stabilize and regularize their immigration status. 
sort of your foundation likes and supports direct services, one recommendation would be to continue to support those nonprofits that do immigration direct services. If your foundation, on the other hand, believes in systems change advocacy, then fund those nonprofits that are trying to educate their state um, legislative and executive branches on uh, you know, laws that are fair and that rise to the level of social justice. And maybe you're a funder on the phone uh, where your board and the foundation funds both direct services and, and advocacy. And then um, that's great because then you can fund nonprofits in your localities that are doing both direct services, helping people get green cards and become lawful permanent residents, as well as funding those nonprofits that are trying to raise awareness and um, engage people to become civic participants and um, educate their, their policymakers in their states. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Fernando. Um, so, Fernando, first of all, I'm going to move into the question and answer period now. So if any of you have questions, you can feel free to uh, chat them to me or any of the panelists. You'll see in the lower right hand of your screen, you should see uh, a chat function there, and you can send a panelist, you can send questions through that out to uh, any of the panelists or, or to me or to, to everyone. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and start doing that. In the meantime, I will get the ball rolling with a couple of questions. Um, so Fernando already started to talk about some of the things that, that we as funders can do. Um, James, I wonder if you could build on that a little bit by talking, you know, from your view, having done this work with Marguerite Casey, do you have any other recommendations for funders about uh, what can be done in this area? We certainly do. And um, I'd like to use the approach that Marguerite Casey uses as an example. Although Fernando has suggested that um, staying consistent with your foundation's mission and the way that it goes about doing its funding is fine. As I mentioned earlier, there's a need to build an infrastructure in the South because the map that Fernando pointed to that showed where um, immigration laws have been introduced and passed in the South, you could probably take a cross-tab map and show the, the very same thing for uh, voter registration laws. You know, very regressive voter registration laws have occurred in those states as well. Uh, really regressive laws against workers, workers' rights, compensation, laws against uh, the criminals that, 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 that help bring about the criminalization of youth. You could overlay those same maps on those same states and you'll probably find that, that they're not only talking about immigration, but they're also, these are like attacks against poor and working people in general on many levels. Um, and our position is an attack on one is an attack on all. And, and, if, and if, given the way that we approach that, we do multi-year general operating grants. And we do that for you know a couple of reasons. One, because it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it gives the, the grantee some stability. It gives them some operating capital. And it's our duty to, to identify um, grantees that work across many issues. That's, you know, that's our strategy. Um, we find multi-issue organizations. Um, that although they may do some direct services as, as a way of like trying to heal or, or address some of the pain that exists right now in the communities that they work in, um, our focus is on the organizing and advocacy part of that so that these policies and these laws can be changed so that they're uh, more in the interest of poor and working families. Now, as I mentioned, there seem to be some opportunities in the South. The South has a history of, uh, of, of fighting racism. Uh, there's a huge possible impact on national policies. Uh, about one-third of the electoral college votes are in the South, which is probably the reason that there's been a concerted strategy by the right to 
first take the houses and senates and then the governorships in the last few election cycles. Um, but then there's also a, an op absolute opportunity for change and growth, we believe, in, in the southern region if you can put resources in the, in the hands of the right kinds of organizations. And in our opinion, those are multi-issue organizations uh, that concentrate not only on direct services. Uh, that's not a great concern, but it's not a great interest of ours either. Our interest is in the, um, the advocacy and organizing among poor and working families and the ability to address and change policy at the local, state, and uh, national levels. And um, we work with organizations that have convinced our foundation that there's a need for a national response, a, a local, a state, and national response to some of these policies that are in place. And our grantees have formed and then challenged our foundation to support, to only support um, organizations that are willing to um, be a part of developing a national strategy and a national platform that's in the interest of poor and working families. I think those are great recommendations, James. I especially appreciate the point about uh, supporting organizations that work across issues. I think a lot of times as funders, we get caught in our particular silos, and a lot of really important work actually doesn't necessarily fit in those silos. And it's something we've seen, I think, especially with Latino community-based groups and other uh, grassroots organizations working in communities of color that they organize around a whole wide set of issues affecting our communities, not, you know, oh, we're going to just focus on education or immigration, but rather we're going to focus on all of these social justice issues because they're all affecting our communities. So I, I think that's a really great point. Um, let me ask we've Ethel learned, and Mary. we learned that from our grantees. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but turning to Isabel and Mary, um, what recommendations do you have for funders? You know, seeing from your view on the ground, do you see are there particular areas where you feel like there's a, an especially great gap right now or where you feel like there's a potential for, for high impact in terms of responding um, to this anti-immigrant uh, tide? Thanks, Dan. Um, so I think that you're right. There, there's a great opportunity here, but also a high need. As I mentioned, um, HICA has, has only one organizer on the planet. We have been so fortunate to have had so many folks come from both coasts and everywhere in between to help organize and to help really get the grassroots um, engaged and on fire about um, about this work. But folks are going to be leaving. I mean, South Carolina has got similar issues, and so folks are going to be migrating there to, to work on the ground in South Carolina, and we've got to capture the energy that has that we have got right now, and, and really use that um, so that we don't go back. I mean, this is the moment for sustained attention um, from funders to help us um, build our capacity and our infrastructure. I mean, I dare say, you know, that you know, we could have considered this, um, and we know the lessons of the past. I don't think it's too late, but we have to start now. I mean, we've just got to respond. I mean, we, we need help on the ground. Uh, yeah, if I could just follow that up. I, I would echo sort of everything that Isabel said. Uh, the uh, it, it, I think it's hard to for people in other states to kind of understand how um, sort, of, how sort of dramatically underdeveloped a state like Alabama is. So that, you know, we tried – for example, just to put together a loyal lawyer referral um, list of people who will who had Spanish language capacity and who are willing to take cases, even for pay, um, people arrested and detained pursuant to HB 56, family law cases, other kinds of basic services cases, and we found is that we we couldn't create such a list um, because the infrastructure simply isn't there. There aren't the people to do the work. Um, legal services here is. Um, uh, restricted. It's an it's an LSC statewide program, which means that they can't represent undocumented persons, um, except in very uh, very strict 
<laughs> exceptions, and uh, and basically there's no one to refer people to uh, for kind of a whole host of of needs. So we're we're talking about pretty pretty basic stuff that some, that other states I think take for granted that that we don't have. That's great. Thank you, Mary and Isabel. Um, so we're getting lots of questions uh, online. Thank you to all of you who are sending them in. Um, there are a couple of questions around uh, coalition building that we've gotten. Um, one in particular uh, from Kane Davis asks, you know, are there other groups in addition to ICA um, and others mm -hmm. representing Latinos who are mm -hmm. actively vocalizing how the law has uh, affected their constituencies and particularly in housing. And I know that both SPLC and ICA are part of the Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice, um, which has built a, a fairly broad coalition, is, is my sense, that has been working against this law. And I wonder if each of you could speak to, uh, you know, how did you manage to do, you know, one, who are the other players who are working with you in the coalition and the groups that they represent? Um, and anything, you know, that in terms of lessons learned or good practices that help to build uh, such a fairly wide coalition on this issue. Sure, um, it's Isabel. So the Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice started in 2007 after immigration reform planks at the federal level. Um, the steering committee members are SPLC, Alabama Appleseed, Hispanic Interest Coalition of Alabama, Greater Birmingham Ministries, Alabama Arise, ACLU, NAACP Statewide, Alabama Dreamers for the Future, and the Birmingham Muslim Society or Islamic Society. Um, and we really, you know, started with a very broad, broad base. It's been quite recently, though, that we've added the NAACP and the Islamic Society based on HB 56. Um, but we still, even though we have got this broad coalition, um, and, and quite frankly, um, with other members such as Greater Birmingham Ministries and Alabama Arise, those are groups um, who have been working with low-income working families for years and years and years, and finally because of the breadth of this immigration issue, it's just realized that it, it helps folks realize how much this touches all of us. Um, but at the same time, while we are working in coalition and it's an incredible group and incredible energy, um, we still just don't have a lot of capacity because for whatever reason, there is not another Latino community-based organization on the ground um, that is, you know, doing this work um, like Kika is. And the, and the coalition has, doesn't have any paid staff. It has one coordinator at this point. Um, and, and we're hopeful that we will be able to get some resources into the state to increase our organizing capacity, um, both in the immigrant community and the allied community as well. This is, um, you know, the hope for the very near future. Mary, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think that that's right. I think that people really have come together in, in uh, incredibly powerful ways and have worked really well together, and that in many ways that has been a model, but um but the but the lack of capacity from most organizations i think is is really you know just just a huge problem uh people kind of take this on in addition to their other full time work yep. and everybody right. prioritizes and we it, all know that coalitions are are very time consuming they are so very time consuming have, right um it, it's it's hard to do i think a related but, question that we've gotten from uh Douglas Patino, uh, a former HIP board member and uh, sort of a HIP godfather, is uh, what what sort of support are you getting from from national organizations, and what has uh, what has that sort of national local uh, alliance been like, and you know what's been working well, anything that could be working better in that area? Um, well, we've certainly gotten an enormous amount of help from national groups, uh, you know, and and our. In, in the litigation, the ACLU National and the National Immigration Law Center are um, are, are co-counsel and are incredibly, you know, involved in in every aspect of it. Have been here, um, at, you know, many times and and are real, you know, full partners. Um, and, and we've had a number of other people who have come to Alabama. I, I, I would say, 
there's a wide variety of experiences with national groups coming here. You know, we joke here that some people want to fly into Birmingham and we have a meeting. And what that means for us is that we have to drive 90 miles to go, you know, meet with them to hear their kind of wanting to hear our stories. Um, and while we think telling the stories is really important, you know, what we have said is, like, we really need help. We just really, really need <laughs> help. Um, mm -hmm. And we have lots of ways that we can ask people to provide help, you know, you know, from you want to do a case, do you want to make a contribution, do you want to do, you know, what is it that you want to do? But, um, but there, you know, certainly sometimes the collaboration can be, uh, you know, does, isn't a net plus. I would say on balance it's, it's you know, hugely a net plus. Um, but, uh, you know, we've certainly gotten more discriminating about kind of being really explicit. You know, if, we, if you want us to drive to Birmingham and have a meeting, like, what are, what are people going to get out of it? What's the, what is the point of this? Um, uh, and, and so, um, you know, I think we want people to come to Alabama. We want them to kind of know what's happening. But we also want to be sort of concrete about what the point is. Probably this is for, uh, go ahead. You said that, go ahead. So many of the things that Mary has said, um, and it was really, um, I mean, like she said, we do need so much help. And so when all of this hit and we were just, you know, plowed over, um, you know, everything was great. I think for us, I mean, it was just a relief to know that people were coming in to help. But I think the more that we have gotten, quite frankly, a little bit more savvy, um, at least for us here at HECA, we sort of have a better understanding about how this is all playing into sort of a whole national agenda that national folks have a better perspective on maybe than we do here on the ground in Alabama. And so it's not just all of this, we're doing this in Alabama just because this is so awful. I mean, it is so awful in Alabama, but um, it's part of a bigger effort that I don't think we really saw the, the impact of. And so um, when we think about how we, you know, what the leave behind is, I mean, one of the things that I know was I've talked to some folks from Arizona is that there, there wasn't there was some question about what was left behind in Arizona after things sort of died down there and, and was the capacity of organizations in Arizona really increased. And, and I think it would be just such a missed opportunity if that were to happen here um, with all the great work that, quite frankly, couldn't have been done without the help of our national partners. Um, but we want to be able to sustain this and certainly sort of making those relationships in lasting ways but also um, – you know, understanding that we've got to continue this work after folks leave, and um, how can we do that in the, in the best way? Great, thanks, Mary. Um, yeah. I have a couple questions. If we can go back to the uh, the slide with the map, we have a couple questions about that and sort of the national view, um, which I'll direct to Fernando and Mary, though others are welcome to chime in. Um, one is asking if we could speak to those states that are passing pro-immigration laws, particularly on the map. You can see we have a little uh, red, white, and blue symbol that shows those states that have enacted a local, uh, what, what are called local DREAM Acts in the past uh, year or two. Um, and then another question is, what does it mean that some of them are partially, uh, you know, almost all of the, the legislation the really draconian immigration laws that have passed in six states that you can see in orange there. Uh, Philippe Wallace, uh, another HIP member and board member, is asking, what does that mean that they're partially or fully blocked? Um, I can, I wonder, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Fernando, and then No, I can, I can try to answer the partially blocked. That's a simple one. Um, so uh, a state passes a law, uh, then there's, a, there's litigation and some folks on one side say it's a good law. Some folks on the other side say it's a bad law. So the law is passed by the legislative branch of whatever state in Alabama. It's, you know, Mon uh, the law is passed by Montgomery, uh, their state br uh, legislative branch. The lawsuit is filed, and then some court, it might be a state court, it might be a federal court, blocks it and says no um, parts of it or all of it are unconstitutional. So that's the uh, that's sort of the meaning of the the block language. It's part of the whole the entire statute 
was either partially or fully blocked, and now we're waiting to see if it goes up further on appeal. And I wonder, Mary, could you speak to, you had mentioned the details of uh, what had been blocked in Alabama. Do you have a sense of, are there particular provisions that have tended to be blocked uh, in these various cases across the U.S.? Sure. Alabama's law is um, dramatically more comprehensive than any other state. So most of the other states have had some combination of kind of provisions that relate to um, the, the, the sh what we call the show me your papers yeah. provision that allows for the arrest and detention based on reasonable suspicion that people are undocumented, SB 1070. Um, a couple of the laws that we're dealing with, we've been involved in the suits in Georgia and in South Carolina. Uh, in South Carolina, there's a provision making it illegal to conceal or harbor, transport undocumented persons. But I'm not aware of any other state that has this wide variety of provisions as in Alabama that that were intended to regulate every aspect of an immigrant's life from, you know, contracts to housing to, you know, kind of all of these things packed together in one bill. Um, so we were, I think, uh, particularly, you know, devastated and shocked to see that this bill was not blocked by the court in, in large part. A few of the provisions were, but um, but these provisions that have been largely blocked in other states were allowed to stand in Alabama. And my sense is, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the show me your papers clause has usually been, which is that, you know, anyone who we think might, you know, if you speak Spanish or, uh, you know, as you said, driving while Latino, <laughs> Um, you can ask, you know, your papers could be demanded. Um, that's been blocked in many states, but not in Alabama. That that's right. That's been blocked everywhere else. Um, where everywhere there's been, else. Okay. That where there has been, um, yes, yes, it has uh, only gone into effect in Alabama. And that's being, and you're in the process of appealing that right now. Yes, that's on appeal to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. But the, but the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals blocked a couple provisions on its own pending the preliminary injunction hearing. It did not block that provision. I see. Okay. Um, and then regarding the, the more positive legislation, we have, I, I do think that's, I've seen that as a bit of a glimmer of hope that several states have passed the DREAM Act. Um, could either of you speak to that, that movement and, and what you've seen? Um, I'll take a quick crack, and then Mary, you can talk about the Alabama. But so the Dream Act refers to um, sometimes the families come here, and uh, let's say mom, dad, and a child come in from uh, Jamaica, Mexico, other countries, and the child comes in as a one-year-old, two-year-old, and um, basically is integrated into American society. Um, but never regularized. The mother and father may not have become lawful permanent residents or U.S. citizens, and neither has the child. The child is now graduating from elementary school or high school and now wants to, has a dream of going to college and has a dream of graduating from college and participating in American life, um, but can't because uh, he or she does not have a lawful permanent residence, lawful permanent residency. So the National Dream Act, um, which keeps getting amended, so I don't want to talk about it because I might say something now and tomorrow it might change, but basically the principle is that if you are a young person of a certain age, under a certain age and if you entered between before a certain period, say 2000, 2005, 2010, it might change, we will allow you to regularize your status and become a lawful permanent resident. And then as a lawful permanent resident, you would be able to enroll in school, and if they say, show me your papers, and now you have papers, you would be able to apply for financial aid. You'd be able to graduate college uh, and participate in American society, be part of the workforce, and pay your taxes. So basically, the, in the, the, big, the macro, that's sort of what the DREAM Act is, is aimed at doing, um, allowing young people to fulfill their dream. And, um, and then in some states, some states have also passed their own individual dream uh, um, method of a, of a local or a, or a statewide dream act. And so that's, it depends on the state as to how the provisions pan out. That's right. And my, oh, Mary, do you want to add anything? 
No, I, I don't live in any states that would pass anything <laughs> <Unfortunately>. positive. <laughs> Sorry. The, the, the only thing I'll add for, for clarity is that, you know, as Fernando mentioned, uh, immigration is generally, uh, up until recently, a federal, you know, a, a fairly clearly delegated to the federal level. So these state dream acts do not allow for a path to citizenship as, uh, as a national federal dream act would be able to do. What they do do is allow for in-state tuition, Sometimes they allow for scholarships, uh, for, for undocumented immigrants to receive scholarships and the like. So they increase access to, to higher education uh, for undocumented immigrants without necessarily creating a, a pathway to citizenship. So they're, right. they, they are sort of a half victory in that area. Yeah. Um, related to the, the DREAM Act, one, one question we did have is from Kate Miller in Connecticut. Um, who says that she has heard that illegal immigrants, or undocumented immigrants rather, uh, have had to sign uh, papers in order to receive the benefit, um, which has left many, uh, you know, ha has left some people too intimidated for fear of, of in some sort of reprisal. Um, have you, Fernando, in those states where you've worked where there have been Dream Acts, have you heard about such a requirement and have you seen that sort of an effect? Could you repeat the first part of the question again? Are there, that there in Connecticut, she, she's the questioner has heard that people are being asked to, to sign papers, uh, I imagine attesting to their undocumented status uh, in order to receive the benefits, the scholarships or the aid or what have you, um, and that people have been reluctant to do that for fear of reprisal or of being deported, I would imagine. Have you? Is that a requirement for many states, as far as you know, in terms of Dream Act? Is there a lot of paperwork involved, and then has that prevented people from really being able to benefit from the Dream Act? Yeah, well, sh no. So, so no, I haven't heard that. But sure, to uh, to access the benefits, you have to say, "I am, you know, Maria, and I entered before 2006, and I'm 17 years old." Um, and, but then the issue becomes trust between the applicant for the in-state tuition benefits and hoping that the community college is not going to then call the immigration the, you know you at the immigration and customs enforcement and say we've got maria here come pick her up but of course you know you have to attest that you are in a in an undocumented status um but that if your state has passed the law you you know you have to fill out whatever paperwork the state is requiring but then it goes back to practicality do then the applicants for a dream act benefits, do they trust the the host to give them the benefits that they said they would give them without turning them in? And, you know, that I can't talk to. Okay. Great. I am just scrolling through uh, questions here. Um, one is, and, and many of you can see them down in the question and answer period, uh, Larry Sieber, from, who's uh, with one of our grantees in the Pennsylvania area, is asking about uh, coalition work with Asian communities, especially Koreans um, and South Asians, uh, are the next largest group of, of immigrants after Latinos. Um, has there been any success in Alabama in working uh, with the leadership of various Asian groups to, uh, to share in your efforts? Oh, sure. Um, and a number of those groups are plaintiffs. In our case, Boat People SOS is a plaintiff. Some of the Asian uh, American legal groups are uh, counsel on the case, um, and so we've, uh, you know, we've definitely reached out and had, and 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 uh, those groups have been kind of participating, both in the litigation and in the broader advocacy efforts. Um, and I, and I think you know beyond that, this has been a very um, powerful kind of multiracial and multi-ethnic um, working group. Uh, the African-American leaders have been um, kind of really, really strong allies, uh, talk about racial profiling in Alabama. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the numbers in terms of kind of our number of immigrants is relatively small, but, it, but it's definitely um, included uh, representatives from the Asian-American community. I, I just briefly want go ahead, Isabel, and then I wanted to talk about coalition building for a second. Just briefly add that you know making sure that we're inclusive of all immigrant communities in Alabama is something that the Coalition for Immigrant Justice has been very keyed into from the very beginning. Um, but you know they're just trust issues because we need to know one another. But those walls are coming down, and, and as Mary said, um, 
uh, Boat People SOS is, is a plaintiff in the lawsuit, and we have, um, you know, gotten some, some great involvement from, from, from some other Asian communities as well, which is a wonderful step. Great, and what I that. wanted to and add is that, to yeah, that um, coalition building is, um, as we've heard from Isabel and Mary, is very time-consuming, and for the funders on the call, if they're considering supporting, you know, collaboration, is to strongly, uh, as I would strongly urge them to consider paying for a coordinator role and paying and thinking about the budget to allow people to participate. Um, in, a, in an ideal world, we would first fund um, a planning grant so that groups would come together and plan, you know, how do we vote, what are we, what are we working on, what's our long-term desired outcome. But in an emergent situa situation, many times we just we we fund and fund cheaply the coalition. But that really it, it just it needs staffing, you know, folks to send out the agenda, to send out reminders, to facilitate the group, um, people with capacity, um, and to fund the participation of the coalition. So there's a bunch of checklists and um, essays written on coalition and, and collaboration best practices. But it's something that's, um, you know, that's really important, especially in something like what's going on in Alabama. Absolutely. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, and James, I wonder if you have, I know Marguerite Casey has done a lot of work around coalition building. Do you have any thoughts on how funders can support coalition building efforts? Sure. I was about to jump in behind Fernando. <laughs> just um, let, You mentioned Douglas Patino. I'd like to say hi because he's a former member of HIPS board, but he's a current member of Marguerite Casey. Now, here's what I was going to jump in and say after Fernando made that very excellent point. Coalitions are difficult. They're time-consuming. But if you look at it in terms of taking the long approach, the long investment approach, um, then they're not as problematic. Yes, Marguerite Casey, for the last three years, has had a special program, a special mini-grant that, um, that allowed our grantees to begin to reach out across the regions that they work in and to work and purposely develop networks with other grantees of Marguerite Casey. Um, We've got some really great ones. As a matter of fact, there's one South by Southwest network that brought together grantees from uh, the Southwest portion of the United States, from Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, with grantee organizations um, in the South, in, in the Gulf Coast and Florida, Atlantic Coast, and Georgia, uh, across all those regions. For the last three years, we've made a special mini grant in the uh, just at the beginning of the summer. It's uh, a, a, a particular amount of money that's set aside and has been set aside for the last three years by our board, and it allows that. But in our very practice, we encourage our grantees to work with each other. And as a matter of fact, our board has challenged us um, to to begin to look at organizations who are willing to do that, to, to take on like permanent sort of coalitions with other grantees both in their state, um, in the surrounding states, in their region, and even nationally. Um, every other year we bring our grantees together to hold a convening um, so that they get a chance to, to know each other. Um, at the Policy Link conference in Detroit a couple of weeks ago, our board created a special pool of money that allowed us to send, I think, about 30 or 40 grantees to PolicyLink. And while they were there, they themselves held like caucuses and meetings and exchanged ideas. And I mean, you know, it, it, you have to be ready for the long haul. It's it's a long-term investment. Those funders out there who uh, went to the, uh, the National Funders, N Neighborhood Funders Group meeting a few weeks ago out in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They probably got sick of some of us from the South uh, because we really tried to focus and, and, and dominate that meeting and invite other funders to join us in the South. 
Um, there's, a, as I mentioned, there's a history of, of, of justice struggle, social justice struggle there. There are organizations that are on the ground across all of those states that we invest in who, who they themselves have a history, a long history, a successful history at fighting all forms of injustices. Um, but you have to sort of start considering maybe changing your approach. Um, maybe not just because of this Alabama law making an investment in the South, but come join the, the Southern Organizing Working Group or the Social Justice Infrastructure Funders Coalition or the Appalachian Funders Collaborative. All of those groups um, are, are, are sort of our place to, to sit down with other funders and begin to talk just like we're talking today and begin to strategize where are the opportunities? Um, how can we collectively invest in capacity building and leadership and, and networking development? And where, where appropriate, strategically appropriate, where, where and what type and what amount of investments need to be made to develop a statewide coalition? And now our grantees are pushing us to, to open our eyes to the, the need for a quick response across the South because of the shifting in the, the General Assemblies in many of the states across the South. Um, they're, they're, they're getting us to think about regional coalitions, investments in regional coalitions. And I think that's something as funders we probably need to consider. Those are great points, James. And I think, you know, going back to your earlier point of uh, Marguerite Casey's support of operating, uh, general operating support, I think actually also helps, uh, helps support all those other things that you mentioned, because with general operating support, it gives more flexibility, I think, to be part of these, uh, these coalitions and to do that, that broader work. Um, I also, since you, you mentioned it or alluded to it a little bit, I want to put in a brief plug for the Patino Moore Award which is an award that Hispanics and Philanthropy and the Association of Black Foundation Executives have created in with, with the support and leadership of the Marguerite Casey Foundation to recognize each year an organization that is doing effective coalition building across black and brown, black and Latino communities. And the first awardee was just announced a few weeks ago as uh, Puente, it's a, an excellent group based in New Orleans. Um, and I think that's sort of, uh, you know, that's sort of just, just uplifting the organizations that are doing that sort of work is an important thing that we as funders can do, um, is recognizing that as a, you know, just as important a best practice as getting your audit done and all the other uh, nuts and bolts stuff working effectively in coalitions is just as important. Um, I want to turn it, you know, we're, we're starting to hit, get close to the end, and I want to ask each of our panelists, you know, um, we've talked about legal aspects, we've talked about organizing. Uh, I'm sure each of you in your work, whether as funders or on the ground, has encountered, you know, a lot of the resistance that we're seeing, that we're seeing a lot of uh, very harsh, uh, negative anti-immigrant sentiment, um, which is connected with all sorts of, uh, you know, histories of, of racial uh, marginalization and, and prejudice and, and other, you know, simple economic uh, concerns uh, that might be being deflected onto uh, immigrants. Um, so I'd just like to ask each of you, what, you know, what have you found is most effective in terms of winning, winning people's hearts and minds um, and sort of shifting their view uh, to one, you know, where, where there's just a greater compassion for immigrants or a little bit more, more sympathy on this issue? Would any of you like to start? Sure, it's Isabel. Um, I think that it really depends you know, on, on sort of where the person is coming from. But, you know, as Fernando earlier sort of gave us an overview of immigration, of the immigration system, I mean, it helps to, when people begin to really understand what the problem is, um, certainly the human stories are, are very critical. And, and also, you know, for Alabama, the, well, the business, the impact on business, but, but also how our reputation is suffering. I think that um, folks who maybe didn't pay too much attention to this when it was in the state house, now that it's in place, are um, 
feeling the effects of it. So, I mean, it's just, it just depends upon, I think, the perspective that people are coming from. What I will tell you is that um, there has been, I mean, there's movement all across the community from sectors that I'm really surprised are taking this up as, as an issue because it is so far reaching in the ways that it has impacted um, the people, all people in our state. Yeah. That's all. Well, and, and we have had, the, I'm sorry, this is uh, Mary Bauer. We have had a huge change even within Alabama when the, you know, when we kind of first talked to lobbyists about this bill, what we were told is this is, you know, in polling, this is the issue on which there's kind of the broadest consensus, the, the sort of anti-immigrant sentiment that it was, it was polling above 80%. Uh, for have some kind some kind of legislation to crack down on illegal immigration, and now just last week there was a poll for the first time showing a majority of Alabamians support the repeal or uh, significant changes to HB 56. That is, you know, in an incredibly conservative, fairly racist state, uh, huge progress, and I do think that it comes from. The sort of these stories over and over and over again, and, and we may find, you know, maybe this is wishful thinking on my part, but I keep thinking, you know, maybe you don't know when you're in a huge historic moment that it is that, and maybe we can look back and at some day in the future and say this was a place where, you know, the narrative was able to change a little bit um, because it, you know, it has done so much damage not just to kind of immigrants but to the state. More generally, and I wonder, Mary, is it? I think both. I think the entire the ACIJ, the coalition, has been doing a campaign called "Is it One Family, um, One Alabama, One fa One Family, One Alabama?" Well, yes. Um, could you speak to? Could either you or someone speak to that a little bit, and what the the message is there? Sure. Um, basically, we launched the campaign last Monday, and it's really an effort to repeal HB 56. There has been um, a state senator who has introduced um, pre filed a bill around repealing HB 56. But it's also really community mobilization. Um, the work that was started, you know, with so many people coming from, from far and wide to help us, um, to, to get grassroots folks engaged in this. Um, but not just at the grassroots at many different levels, you know, working to repeal HB 56. But, but I would just like to say that, you know, we are so focused right now as a state on the specific, um, on this repeal, and, and, and that's definitely our campaign at this, at this moment, um, that we have such more long-term work to do so that we can, so we don't have to keep fighting back these sorts of progressive um, policies that come down the pipe, so that we can create an Alabama where that wouldn't be possible to happen. Yeah, Ben, on, as to your question, what wins hearts and minds, I would refer all of us to Andy Goodman, the king of communications, um, who tells us that storytelling is, is it. Uh, we began this call with Mary um, giving us some boring legal details, but where I perked up was where she, be, uh, she started then sharing with us stories of callers and how this father says this and this young woman says that. And so those stories are what, you know, grabs at my heart and um, perks me up. Um, so I guess a suggestion would be for the nonprofits on the call to, um, to strengthen your communication strategies, look at your websites, look at your brochures, look at your email blasts, and are you personalizing everything you do or are you giving boring statistics? And for the funders on the call is to, is to fund capacity building marketing to our nonprofits so that they can, um, you know, go hire marketing consultants to help them tell their story in a more compelling way that would win hearts and minds. Thank you, Fernando. You're exactly right about that. And I think that's part of what, uh, what the Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice is getting at very effectively, just with the name of One Family, One Alabama. You know, so as soon as you start talking about a family, uh, I think it's harder to dehumanize and stereotype um, because you have a, you know, you have an image of a of a family, um, as opposed to whatever other stereotype people bring to mind when they think of undocumented immigrants. Um, what, James, did you have any any thoughts on the the winning hearts and minds question? 
Well, and I, I agree with you, Ben, on um, the focusing on families, and, and that's what we try to do in our grant making here at Marguerite Casey. But you know, the one thing that really stands out to me in terms of winning hearts and minds is like how politically sophisticated and mature the organizations are, not only in Alabama, but across the region, how they very quickly recognize that, um, you know, that this, that although the, the, the target right now are, are undocumented immigrants in Alabama, that it could easily be them tomorrow or it was them yesterday, or how some of the struggles that they're working on in terms of um, uh, incarceration, uh, the, the reform of criminal and juvenile justice systems interface with, with this, um, how the tax on workers' rights interface with this, how a tax on voter rights interface with this. I'm just really struck every time I go down there or have a chance or the honor and pleasure to sit down with one of our grantees or any organization that I've run into in the South and just see the level of sophistication and the ways that that where we may fail in terms of being able to bridge silos, how quickly and easily, and I guess out of necessity, that they're doing that in the South. And that's why I continue to say it's a, an excellent investment on the part of uh, funders. And it's an area of the country that I think um, that if we concentrate on it and we do the things that Mary and Isabel have suggested, and, and Fernando as well suggested, where are the opportunities, where are the resources needed, um, I think we'll see some real change that could have a national impact in the next few years. Thanks, James. And, you know, on that, I think that's a great segue to my last question. We have just five or six minutes left. If any of you ever watched the McLaughlin group, uh, he ends with predictions, Pat Buchanan. So I'm not going to do exactly that. Uh, but <laughs> I would like to ask each of our panelists to, to just share, you know, what do you see coming up in Alabama or more widely across the nation in 2012 and beyond that in terms of uh, immigration policy, um, and what what should funders and other leaders be keeping in mind as a key, you know, as one key strategy to be proactive as this landscape uh, continues to change, and unfortunately, as you know, we we will likely see uh, continued legislative battles like the one that we've seen in 2011. So um, we have heard that there is the possibility that there will be a both citizenship um, bill filed. In Alabama, we know that there's going to be lots of um, work done to try and tweak HB 56. We know, of course, that there is a been a pre-filed bill to repeal HB 56. So we, you know, going into the next leg legislative session in 2012, we're going to be pretty busy on that. Um, I'd say, in terms of strategies going forward, you know, Alabama is really untapped territory for folks who want to do civic engagement. We know that every year there are over 4,000 immigrants who become eligible for citizenship, and there is no other organization aside from PTAC that is doing anything to try and move people along the pathway to citizenship. And after that, to get registered to vote, and then turning that into um, getting out the vote, so that ultimately we can change what Alabama looks like. Um, that is the longer-term strategy that the Hispanic Interest Coalition of Alabama is working for, because Ultimately, that's how we get people to lift their voices, to have a, a, a to be participating in the conversation, and you can do that um, most effectively when you're a voter who, who has a, a, a say in that. So that will be our focus: is to continue to help people integrate socially, politically, and economically. Um, and we will you mentioned that there is a huge opportunity to do some civic engagement work here in Alabama. That the time is now to do that work. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. Mary, any uh, yes, you yeah. Can? Yeah, I, I think um you know what we know about this law is that 
the bad guys are really crowing about it. They feel like they cre- they had all these crazy provisions they came up with, and they had this spaghetti on the wall philosophy, which is, you know, they would put a bunch of things in a law and see what stuck, and they're super happy that um, this disaster has been wrought upon our state, and they have, you know, legislators here have been asked, you know, sort of, are there the unintended consequences of the law, and several of them have said, no, there are no unintended consequences of this law. All of wow. these consequences were actually intended, um, and people are being driven from the state, and that, from their perspective, is a wild success. Um, so there's no doubt that there will be efforts in other states to do, you know, if not this, something like this. Uh, in other places, and so I think we're as a as a kind of national community going to need to be very nimble about where the resources are placed and kind of how um, how how people are and communities are prepared to respond. Thanks, Mary. Fernando or James, any thoughts? Uh, well, you know, I made I made reference to Andy Goodman. I'll make reference to Whitney Houston. And her song that says, um, <laughs> children are the future. Um, I'm looking at Occupy Philadelphia, Occupy New York. And, um, y- you know, these these movements are being led by younger people, the next generation. So to the nonprofits on the call, I would urge you to place young people on your boards and hire young people on your staff. And to the, non-pro- the foundations on the call, I would urge you, to fund leadership development, um, non nonprofits that that specifically and intentionally uh, develop leadership, because that's the future. Um, and so the prediction is not so much an immigration prediction, but a hope that the next generation, with with them as leaders of our nonprofits, of our foundations, as policymakers, as staff of nonprofits, um, you know, things will change. Thanks, Fernando. And James, you get the the last word about the future. Well, uh, let me begin by saying that I agree with what Fernando just said, what Isabel pointed out, and what Mary pointed out. Um, In terms of predictions for the future, for 2012 at least, um, well, given that seven of the eight states that uh, Margaret Casey invest in 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 the South are among the 10 poorest states in the United States, that unemployment is beginning to increase, even though in the South, uh, because of right-to-work states and depressed wages and benefits, um, and unemployment was has been pretty low in the South compared to the rest of the United States. Um, it's increasing. Uh, with this particular immigration law, it doesn't seem as though there was a uh, an economic impact analysis done, um, like some of the other states, even in Georgia, they did an economic impact analysis. And it's beginning to create an unheard of coalition between um, chambers of commerce, um, industries in the construction sector, and in the agricultural sector to, to form unheard of, unseen collaboratives, coalitions um, in, in against this particular piece of legislation. But I don't, but given the fact that most of these general assemblies are now completely uh, uh, switched, and something that hasn't happened since Reconstruction have completely switched over to more conservative right-wing um, elected officials, I don't see these pieces of legislation ending. I, as a matter of fact, most of our grantees predict that um, they're going to increase in the future. And all I can say is, for you funders out there, if you're not a member of the Southern Organizing Working Group, the Social Justice Infrastructure Funders Collaborative, or the Appalachian Funders Collaborative, or are not investing in the South, you should give strong consideration to doing that. That's great. Thank you, James. And thank you to all four of you. I thought uh, 
your your insights were excellent. We really appreciate your taking time out of uh, very busy schedules to be with us today. I know I, I learned a great deal from it. And I also want to thank all of those of you who are attending and participating and have been sending in your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to, to all of them. Um, but uh, very much appreciate all of your involvement. And lastly, thank you to APIP and AbbVie for co-sponsoring this webinar with us today. Um, my last note is uh, that we will be sending out uh, an email with resources as well as with uh, this PowerPoint uh, presentation, this short PowerPoint as an attachment. And we'll also be making the recording of this webinar available on our website. And both of, that, both of those things should happen within the next uh, few days, let's say by, by Thursday at the latest. Um, so th thank you again for, for joining us today. And uh, we hope that all of you will continue to be part of this and other conversations uh, in the HIP network. Thanks. Thank